This is the Woman's Hockey Life Podcast. She is a two-time Olympic silver medalist, two-time top 10 finalist for the Patty Kazmaier Award, four-time gold medalist at World Championships, Boston College alumni, CWHL Clarkson Cup champion with the Boston Blades, and now co-founder of Movement in a Box. Welcome, Molly Shouts. Thank you so much for having me. So during my research on your outstanding goaltending career, I think my mouth was kind of hanging open, <laughs> reading all of your accomplishments that you've had every single year in college and then onward into your professional career. It's like super inspiring. So before we get into all of that great stuff, I wanted to take it back a little bit. Um, just where did your interest in hockey come from? Where did you start playing and how did you become a goalie? Uh, growing up in Minnesota, you know, as soon as I was old enough, my parents would drag me around on a sled on the pond. And as I got older and learned to walk, I had skates on my feet right away. So my childhood, I was very fortunate uh, to grow up with that pond and learn to skate and fell in love with the game. Um, the goalie side of it came from my older brothers. I'm not going to lie. I, I have two older brothers and I want to be just like them. And so obviously as that younger sister tagging along, uh, can I play with you? And the answer was always no, of course. And finally, one day, my, my middle brother, Michael, said, fine, you can play, but if you play goalie. And I said, sure, I'll play goalie. I just want to play with you. And uh, he said, all right, you can't tell mom, you can't cry, and you can play. <laughs> and so I started with street hockey and just fell in love with, obviously, being around my older brothers and uh, all the kids in the neighborhood. And uh, when the time was right, I did a learn to play hockey program and immediately moved right into goalie on ice and never looked back. So Nice. Uh, I have my brother to thanks and uh, to blame for 25 years of playing goalie. That's awesome. I feel like that's like the commonality between just a lot of just hockey players as they grown up, especially with women. They're like, oh, well, you can your brother's like you could play, but only if you play goalie. And if we hit you, don't cry. Like, don't I don't want to hear that. <laughs> it's I a familiar like a story. Of, yeah. <laughs> It's a good story, though, because when you think about it, you're like, man, you know, if I didn't have my older brothers, like, would I have wanted to play hockey? Like, would I have gotten into this? So shout out to older brothers for getting us into what we're doing today. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. Um, and as much as I, I love that, it's also great to see the new era of, of female hockey players don't need that because they actually have female hockey players to look up to. Right. Um, and, that, and that's so different. So it's fun to see that shift and that growth. But there's still nothing better than, than beating your brothers out on the ice. I could not agree more, especially when I'm pretty sure when you probably stopped like your first like hard slap shot, you're probably like, oh, I'm getting there. I'm getting pretty good. It's a good feeling. <laughs> it is definitely. So at, we're going to fast forward a little bit to Boston College. So you were a standout from your freshman year all the way until you graduated. What do you think contributed to your constant success on the ice? Yeah, you know, I was really fortunate to attend Boston College. It was always a dream school and uh, everybody knows with recruiting, anything can happen. And especially in the goalie position, you really have to time it right um, to be able to be a starter when you start. So uh, I had obviously a great coaching staff and, and Katie King Crowley and Courtney Kennedy. They're two of the best that uh, push you on the ice, but they make you laugh harder than you ever thought possible and made the game really fun. And obviously they played at that level that I dreamed of being at. So to be able to go to the rink every day and learn from them uh, made a huge difference in, in my growth. Having goalie coach and Allison Kwan out there, she was a BC alum and just learning through her and her experiences. Um, but I was really fortunate to just join an incredible team of girls. Um, you know, some of us could have chosen other schools or I know some of the powerhouses that were already winning championships. And there's a, a strong group of two or three classes in a row who really wanted to come and make a difference and leave a mark on a school and, and grow it. And that started with a class or two ahead of me and it just trickled down and to play with Kelly Stack, uh, she was part of my group and Allie Thunstrom and you know, Tracy Johnson, Deb Spillane, Maggie Taverna, all these girls that you might not know about, but they really led the way uh, for players like me. And then the younger kids obviously coming through were even more talented than us. So um, it really, they built a, a wonderful team of just girls who love to play hockey and, and work hard. And we believed we could be better than we probably should have been my first year or two. And we, we played that underdog role and we upset a lot of top teams. And I think that gave us a lot of confidence moving forward that, you know, we belong in the top five in the country and, and we can win those games. And 
um, obviously that snowballed and turned into you know some of the best years of my life was playing college hockey at, at BC. Nice. So what would you say is like one of your favorite moments? If you had to choose one or two, what would be one of your favorite moments? Honestly, so going to a Boston school, it has to be the Beanpot Championships. Uh, it's very rare you get to play for a championship on a, a Tuesday night in February. And uh, to be the best in Boston, I was fortunate enough to win three of them in my four years. And um, in particular, my freshman year, we took down Harvard. Uh, we were big underdogs and went to three overtimes. Um, I think it was at like one in the morning, uh, Anna McDonald scored that game winning goal and uh, the rest is history. So that, that memory at home ice, um, I think I, something like 74 saves over the course of the entire game. It, it's just one that stands out. And I think, like I said earlier, it was, was kind of that turning point of we belong here. We can, we can do a lot of damage in the next four years. So that was the, the tipping point. Nice. So what was like, I mean, going through triple overtime, I mean, and you know, like you're kind of like not the favorite going in, what is like running through your mind as like the game is going on and being played out? Yeah. Uh, what's funny is we were up early. So we played that underdog role. They came back and tied it up uh, going into the third. So it really came down to 20 minutes or we thought it would it ended up coming down to four more periods. Um <laughs> At that point, you're just, you're locked in. You're having fun. Uh, one of my family's favorite stories is my oldest brother was at the game, and he he could be an athlete. He's a, a PhD in philosophy, so he went the other road. <laughs> and in between whistles, I looked up, and it was again midnight. And he just tapped his watch, and I shrugged my shoulders, like in the middle of the game. And mom's like, "What are you doing? Like, why why is she looking up here?" And so. <laughs> You, I mean, it's fun. You're playing a game. It's a tournament. Um, obviously, there's a lot on the line and you feel the pressure. But at that point, you know, anything can happen. You're just trying to make that one extra save that allows your team to go and score that goal. And unfortunately, that happened. Um, but yeah, it high pressure, but it definitely it, it prepared us because we went on in the Frozen Four to actually play overtime games as well. So it, it's kind of been there, done that. You know, we know we can pull it off. So a lot, a lot of fun memories from that game. That's awesome. I always love when you have like those moments in sports and you're like, you know, okay, my career isn't over yet. So I'm probably going to experience this again. And then when you did, you had that, you had it to fall back on. So it wasn't something new, like, oh my gosh, how are we going to handle this for the next like overtime or triple overtime? How are we going to do this? You're like, Hey, we already did it. Let, let's just go do it again. <laughs> let's have a good time. <laughs> it's funny. The goalie position is so stressful and you think about all of it, but at the end of the day, it's one of the simplest jobs in all of sports. Like keep this rubber puck from crossing this goal line <laughs> and you did your job. And so no matter what the stakes are, you know, it's, it's the same job. And once the puck is dropped, it's like, all right, just keep the puck out of the net. Um, and sometimes we overthink it. So whether it's a triple overtime, you know, championship or an Olympic gold medal, or you're playing pond hockey in the backyard, you know, playing goalies the same, just keep the puck out of the net and people are usually happy. <laughs> I'm glad you have such like a positive mindset on it. Cause if I even tried to attempt goalie, even if it was on beer league level, as soon, I think I would lose motivation every time I got scored. <laughs> <laughs> every time I was just like, Oh, what am I doing out here? You can ask my teammates. I can talk about a little bit lighter now. I was pretty intense uh, when I was playing. So I think time is time has helped me out a little bit. That's good. As experience went on. That's good. That's good. So is there any point that you can remember in your hockey career where you knew you were going to push to make um, an Olympic to make the Olympic roster? Yeah, you know, it, it's funny looking back. I was in fourth grade when I watched the 98 team win a gold medal. And I went in the next day and said, that's what I want to do. I told my teacher and my classmates, like, I want to go to the Olympics someday. And everyone was really nice about it, but they're like, yeah, sure. And good luck. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, nothing happens overnight, obviously. It's year by year and um, started, I got invited to the development camp when I was probably 14 or 15. And that was the first time seeing players from all over the country. And right. you know, so, wow, there's some really good talent out here. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say the college recruiting process and the interest I was getting in some of the conversations was like, all right, I, I have a lot of choices here, which means coaches must like me. I must be pretty good. And so that kind of built that confidence. Um, but I made my first national team camp after my freshman year of college. And so obviously that was exciting and terrifying. And I left that camp saying, I, I have a ways to go. So it was a really good wake up call of you're good, but you're not that good. Right. Um, and so that, that really kind of, pushed me that next step and 
um, gained a lot of confidence, obviously being there and seeing what it takes and coming back to school and talking to coaches and, and seeing, you know, training with stack every day and knowing that was our goal. Um, so I would say right around senior year of high school, freshman year of college, uh, I was like, you know what, there's, there's a light in this tunnel. And, and maybe if I pursue it, you know, maybe I'll make that dream come true. So it's it, uh, very fortunate. That's awesome. I always like that because me being an athlete in high school with track, they said that to us too, you know, you're good now, but when you get in front of other people from wherever, you know, I lived in New Jersey. So you get in front of somebody from California or Idaho or wherever, you know, you're going to see like, okay, am I really that bad? Like, am I really that good? So I think that's a great point that you made. And for anybody that's listening, that is younger and has this goal of joining team USA or team Canada, like you can get to that camp and realize like, Hey, that girl might be playing better than you, or she might be faster on the break than you. So I think that's definitely something that you don't think about right up front. So I like that you put that into perspective because that's, I think that's very important to know going into a camp, like you're not going to be necessarily the best, but <laughs> you're going to try your best. at least. Exactly. And you can learn from everybody else and the coaches and then you have those two decisions to make is one, well, I'm not good enough and I guess I'll never make it or, all right, I see what it takes. I'm going to go back to work. And next time I get invited, I'm going to be that much better. So. Right, exactly. Yeah. So can you remember when you first got to camp, like what was running through your head? Like, were you nervous, scared, <laughs> or excited, a mix of everything? Like what was going on? Oh, it's a mix of every emotion. Um, <laughs> you know, it, my camp was in Lake Placid. So you walk into the Olympic training center and I see Angela Giro and Jenny Potter and Natalie Darwitz. And I was just like, don't say a word, like <laughs> keep my head down, just, you know, do my thing, find people I know. Cause I grew up idolizing them. Um, and obviously they were so welcoming and, and awesome about it, but there's definitely that moment of like, wow, these are players I've been watching my whole life. Um, but really walking into the locker room for the first time and seeing a USA Jersey hanging in a stall and being able to put that on and step on the ice, uh, that's where those emotions come in and you're like, wow, I'm, I'm here. Uh, you know, this has been a dream to put that Jersey on and right. let's go give it everything we have. So it, it's definitely, uh, it's definitely nerve wracking stepping on the ice and obviously being a goalie, it's pretty obvious. Every time you make a mistake, they count it up on the scoreboard. Mm -hmm. Um, but I remember Kinger and court kind of pulling us aside and like, just be confident, play your game. You're going to get scored on. Don't, that doesn't matter. Like just <laughs> keep competing, do your thing. And, and be you. And so that was helpful hearing it from them because they've been through it before that, you know, you don't have to be perfect to make this team just be you. Um, right. And so that was, that was helpful, but you know, you let a goal and you look right to the bench and you're like, oh man, what's coach saying? Or right. <laughs> um, make a big save. You're like, all right, I belong here. So it's such a roller coaster the whole week. Um, oh my gosh. I could so. not imagine. I think me, if I was in the goalie position, I probably would do the same thing. Like, oh man, <laughs> what are they thinking over there? Like, did they write something down? What did they write? Yeah. Exactly. Down? <laughs> yeah. What, they, what they just write down. And right. so you That's can get awesome. in your own head. Yeah, definitely. I would think quickly because like you said, you get scored on, you're like, dang, like, what am I doing right now? <laughs> <laughs> so now fast forward, you made the Olympic roster. So you just graduated college. Now you're getting ready to head into your first Olympic games in 2010. What was that experience? Like just preparing for the camp and getting ready to go. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, it's every, it's every emotion you can imagine. So you're at this, uh, you know, five day camp with 40 other women who every single one of them could make the team. It, it comes down to, you know, what the coach wants and team chemistry. So it's definitely a high pressure situation. Um, I remember you finished your last scrimmage and they announced the team the next morning. So everybody's sitting at dinner, you know, just stressing out or calling home. Nobody's sleeping that night. It, it's horrible. And you, you get to the meeting and coach walks in and I couldn't even tell you what he says for the first five minutes. Cause everyone's like, just get to the point. Like, we don't care if it was a hard decision. We don't care. <laughs> like just, just tell us. Um, and so reading off the roster, Oh, you're just waiting to hear your name called, but you're also waiting to hear if your friends' names are called. And it's such a whirlwind. You probably only hear about half the names. And then very quickly they say, you know, if you didn't make the team, please stand up and, and exit the room and you'll have a plane ticket waiting for you. And so you only have five, 10 minutes to say goodbye to your, some of them, your teammates, your college friends. Um, you obviously feel so excited. 
but you also empathize with your teammates who are just as close and, and didn't make it. So it definitely took a few hours and in, in calling home and getting to tell them the good news. And, um, you know, after a day or two, it starts to sink in that, you know, I just made the Olympic team and, you know, just saying that out loud is the, what you've been waiting for your whole life. So it, it's definitely a whirlwind. And then really the, the true work starts for the next six months. It's a tough day. That's for sure. Yeah. So moving on from like that weird, just emotion, the emotion roller coaster day, you know, you're exhausted, you didn't sleep. So moving forward now you're at the Olympic games. So if there was like one or two moments that stuck out to you, uh, what would it be and why? So one of the veterans on the team before the game said, you know, the Olympics are just like any other world championship, except totally different. <laughs> and it's so true because you get there and it's still a hockey tournament. There's still the eight countries. You're still trying to score more goals than the other team. Um, but now you're surrounded by every other sport and every other country and the media is there and everybody back home suddenly cares about women's hockey. And it, it can be very overwhelming. Um, but also incredibly exciting. So I think looking back, there's really nothing that beats uh, walking into opening ceremony for that first time as a part of Team USA. So, you know, you're not only wearing the USA hockey crest, but the Team USA logo, and you're walking with every other athlete. And my parents were in the stadium. It was in Vancouver, so close to home. Right. And just that excitement and anticipation finally those doors open and you get to walk out into the stadium of just celebration. And uh, it, it's just different than anything I've ever experienced. It was so much emotion and excitement and celebration and just to, to be part of something you watched as a kid your whole life and, and looked up to. So that entire experience was something I'll never forget and sharing that with my family and teammates. Mm -hmm. um, and then obviously that gold medal game, um, you train for four years or a lifetime for a chance at those 60 minutes. And um, obviously we came up just short and that's right. devastating and, and always will be, but uh, to have an Olympic medal placed around your neck and to, you know, leaving the rink that night, I just had an Olympic medal in my pocket and right. I would keep pulling it out and looking at it. And it's like, is this really mine? Like, yeah. I know it's not the color we wanted, but, but look at this, like, look what we did. And Right. I feel to go and share that with my family, who is such a huge part of that journey. Um, I think those two moments stick out in my mind for sure. That's awesome. Yeah, I definitely just, I know just from being a spectator, watching the opening ceremony, it always is like the nice, like introduction to the Olympics. You're like, wow, like these athletes like are incredible. They spent however many years training for this one time thing. And it's just, it's really nice to see all of you guys just walk out as like a team, just individual athletes. It's, I think to me, that's like one of the best moments of watching the Olympics. <laughs> Cause you're like, you know, you don't know what's going to happen or anything, but you're like, you know, they made it like, this is their moment. Like let them bask in all of this going on. So um, now after your first Olympics, you joined the CWHPL, uh, CWHL and you played two seasons with the Boston Blades. And I also believe you were um, an assistant coach for UMass at the time, right? That's correct. Yep. Okay. So what was it like balancing now your professional career and then your coaching career at the same time? Yeah, it was an interesting transition leaving college, um, obviously where you're very structured life and uh, you get taken care of with practice times and games every weekend. It, it's just a different world. Um, but we had such a fun team and the players in that league played because they loved the game of hockey, right? We weren't getting paid. Right. Um, we, a lot of us were training for the next Olympics, but a lot weren't either. They're were just incredible hockey players that loved and wanted to play. And so it's a really fun balance um, getting to skate with that group and in some ways the pressure was off. I wasn't vying for a national championship anymore. It was just playing hockey and, and trying to get better. So uh, we would train in the morning, skate at night, um, and then I would go down to UMass and, and help coach the goalies down there. So it was fun to have a different perspective and share what I was learning with, with those. So we had a great group of girls training in Boston. So in the morning we'd do our off ice and at night uh, we would have practice, but that left a lot of hours open. And so I would coach down at UMass Boston. Uh, one of my college teammates was the head coach. And it was a blast just learning from her, being on the ice, uh, teaching these goalies what I was learning and, and sharing my experiences and 
being just around a really fun group of girls um, is a good break from what we are doing and, and just the intensity of what we are training at uh, to go down and, and be around that group and, and see them develop as well. They had a great season. So I did that and I, I volunteered at some nonprofits and just try to keep busy and build a life beyond just hockey. Um, right. But it, it was a fun couple of years, that's for sure. That's awesome. So how do you feel if anything, if you're coaching, do you think your coaching helped you in the CWHL and then just going into the Olympics? Do you think getting that different perspective kind of enhanced your own game? Yeah, absolutely. Anytime you can take a step back and, and have a different perspective or, or see things from a different angle, it also showed me like what my goalie coaches were looking at during practice or, you know, some of the conversations where I was like, how dare they say that? Like, no, that's, that's exactly what they should have said. <laughs> you know, I'm saying the same things to these goalies. Um, so just kind of wearing both shoes, it, it was definitely helpful to my development. And I learned a lot as a coach, obviously not all players make great coaches. So it was a good experience um, just to learn how to balance all that and, and let these girls develop on their own as well. Okay. And then you officially retired in 2015. And can you describe like what emotions were running through your head as you made your announcement? Cause that was right after the second Olympics. And that was in 2014 and you got another silver. So what was running through your head as you made that announcement to officially retire? Yeah, it, it came with a lot of thinking. It definitely wasn't something I took um, lightly. So like you had said, I was playing in the CWHL. I was coaching. Um, I was working part-time at a nonprofit. And to be honest, it was like uh, January, February morning at 5 a.m. at the gym, snowy Boston. And I was like, I... I don't think I want to do this anymore. <laughs> like I, I think, you know, and that was the first time it was okay in my brain to say that it, it didn't feel this pressure of like, no, you have to, it was like this calming piece of, you know what, maybe that's okay. Maybe there is life beyond what you're doing right now. And um, so it's definitely a slow process. I kind of had that aha moment, um, but obviously finished the season, finished everything just to make sure. And uh, like, obviously decisions, your mind changes all the time. But by the end of that season, I knew I just wasn't as committed. Um, my heart wasn't in it. And if it's not, that's not fair to my teammates, myself. Um, there's a lot of incredible goalies out there who deserve that spot. So um, I made that decision and it was definitely a, a weight off in a way. It was disappointing because I had never quite accomplished that dream of winning the gold medal. But um, you know, the journey and the people I met and the experiences I had and, you know, I wouldn't trade it for anything. So it, it was definitely the right time for me to, to make that step and walk away. So no regrets there. Nice. That's awesome. I always like hearing the differences and the stories between how athletes came to their decision. And I just like how you're just like, Hey, I was in the gym and you know, it just wasn't working. <laughs> so I just had it was cold. It was dark. I was like, you know what? <laughs> Oh, I'm good. I, I did nothing. I'm good. Now. Like, you know what? Do I really want to get up this early and exactly. keep trying to go for? Because I mean, at that point, you had another about three years until. So, I mean, if you were already feeling like that and you're not even nowhere anywhere close to getting to that next Olympics, I could totally understand wanting to kind of scale it back. Do you feel that um, you playing in the CWHP, CWHL and then also just coaching, do you think wearing all those hats and working part-time, do you think that also is why you felt so at peace because you had some other things that you were interested in doing and wanting to accomplish? Yeah, definitely. I think that helped, um, especially this nonprofit. It was called Cradles to Crayons outside of Boston. Um, and it was all about providing everyday items to kids uh, zero to 12. So we worked in a giant warehouse with volunteers and put together these kid packs. And it was my first job away from hockey. They didn't know I was an Olympian for the first year that I volunteered there. Like one day they're like, how are you here at two o'clock on a Tuesday? And finally they figured it out. Okay. So now stepping away from hockey, um, you know, you talked about working part-time for, it was called cradle to crayons or crayons to cradle. Uh, cradles to crayons. Yeah. There we go. Okay. So <laughs> Now you are actually the co-founder of your own brand and company called Movement in a Box. So describe what led you to that company and why. Yeah, it definitely wasn't a linear path. Um, so I, <laughs> I worked part-time at that nonprofit, um, bounced around a little bit, and ultimately found myself moving to Southern California to take a job back in hockey, loosely, with the Anaheim Ducks. Um, oh, wow. 
I had heard really great things about their fan development department uh, and interviewed, was lucky they got a grant to expand right at that time. And so I spent five years working in their um, youth education and community program. So I oversaw a lot of their school programs like street hockey and the science of hockey and physical fitness leadership and really got to be creative and coming up with ways to connect hockey to academics. Mm. So it was a great way to be involved with hockey, but I wasn't on the ice every day. I wasn't coaching and um, I knew that's not what I wanted to do. I was burnt out of that. So this was a neat way to connect my two passions. And um, during that, I also volunteered at the Youth Olympic Games in Norway and started to really, from all these different experiences, piece together the power of youth sports and connecting that to uh, personal development and community and confidence and realizing that was the direction I wanted to go in. Um, and so throughout the course of all these years, I kept in contact with our Olympic strength and conditioning coach, her name's Sarah Cahill. And we, and we bonded a lot during the Olympic training. Um, I spent a lot of extra time as the backup goalie in the weight room and, and doing conditioning. And we just shared our passion in life for, for making a difference, especially in um, young kids, early childhood development and providing more access and opportunity to movement. And we, we kept in touch. I went my way with the docs. She was a personal trainer, worked for a few nonprofits. But we always came back to this idea of like, what can we do together uh, to make a tangible difference and to provide more opportunities? And throughout uh, COVID, we kept in touch and she came up with the idea of movement in a box. And similar to a lot of subscription boxes, uh, activities and equipment can arrive on a doorstep for a family to open up and play together. And it's screen free, it's research based, um, all age appropriate to develop those fundamental movement skills that you might not think about. Um, so we're teaching how to hop, skip, jump, throw, catch, stretch, while combining that with learning concepts. So shapes, colors, numbers, letters, and really following the research that shows kids learn better when they're active. Right. And right now in the US, only six states require daily PE. And so we're moving so much more towards science, math, uh, technology, which are incredibly important, don't get me wrong, but young children need to move if we're gonna optimize their learning. And so we came up with Movement in a Box and we launched back in April with our first subscription box. Nice. Um, we're getting ready to ship box two in a few weeks here. So um, very exciting. It's definitely a whole new adventure and, and something I never, dreamed of, you know, being an entrepreneur was not part of the career path I ever envisioned. I learned how to spell entrepreneur in the first couple of weeks. Uh, so, so we're learning together and really relying on, you know, those lessons we learned from playing hockey and, and those networks and um, every day is a grind. We don't know, you know, how it will all play out, but we believe in each other and we believe in, in the product and, and making sure as many kids have access to it. So it, it's been really fun to combine passions and, and kind of take everything I've ever learned and try to run our own company. So we're really excited for the future and, and to see if we can grow this and, and get it into a lot of different homes and daycares and preschools. Yeah, I think that's incredible. When I was doing my research and I saw that, I was like, oh my gosh, she has like a subscription box. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> that's definitely where I feel like the market is going with like certain products because it just makes it so much more accessible for a lot of people to get it instead of only being sold in like certain stores and certain areas and things like that. So I definitely think you're on the right path <laughs> with that. That is incredible. And then also, so where would you like to see your company in the next three to five years? Yeah. So for us, like I said, we're just getting started. So there's a lot of opportunities to grow in, in different directions. And, and right now we're really going down the preschool and daycare route. Um, we believe uh, it, it fits perfectly with those guidelines uh, and, and developmental standards. And it really would help provide access to, to families and, and to kids who might not otherwise be able to afford a subscription box showing up to their door. So I hope you guys enjoyed that episode of the Women's Hockey Life podcast. Unfortunately, we did experience technical difficulty right at the end there. So I just wanted to let you guys know that you can follow Molly on Instagram and on Twitter with the same username at Shaus729 and that's Shaus, S-C-H-A-U-S 729. 
And you can also give her company a follow at Movement in a Box on Instagram. And they also have a website, www.movementinabox.com. Thanks so much for listening. We'll catch you guys next time.